good evening everyone. Just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are here today on the land of the Gaimagal people, part of the Eora Nation. The Gaimagal are the traditional owners of this saltwater country and are part of the oldest surviving continuous culture in the world. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So tonight we're talking about maintaining our mental health in winter. And that's an interesting topic, isn't it? Given it's been freezing for the, for the last month or two. And uh, I'm not sure how you're managing the cold. I'm sure if you're a skier and you like the snow, you're reveling in it. But for those of us that don't ski uh, and, uh, and aren't great um, lovers of the cold, it's not been a great time. <clears throat> I came back from Bali after doing a convention over there and been swanning around in a sarong and a costume and got off the plane to 10 degrees and blinding rain. I wasn't very happy, I can assure you, when I got back. So tonight we're going to talk about um, managing our mental health in these times. And I wanted to come at it from a couple of uh, from a couple of. Uh, directions and the first one was I wanted to talk about how we feel and uh, I was just discussing this with someone before we came on live and we were talking about the fact that there's a propensity for many of us to go to the low mood depression uh, you know some anxiety <clears throat> and I wonder if some of that isn't that we're a little more disconnected from each other in these colder months and uh, that often leads to a sense of feeling lonely in the world and uh, perhaps if we've carried a bit of loneliness in our history and we've had difficulty connecting with people or having longer, more meaningful friendships, um, you know, we, we may actually go to the toxic level of loneliness which, loneliness, which is despair and isolation. And these are really tough times to be in that because there's not a sense of being out and about uh, <clears throat> taking a wander, having an ice cream, doing the things we do in summer, taking a walk in the in the bush. Um, I mean, some people may do that because they just rug up and do it and good on them. But for those of us that are probably less likely to do that, it can be more difficult to stay connected to one another. And of course, when we're talking about loneliness, we're talking about the gift of loneliness is also reaching out. And that's the hard thing to do. There's always a view, particularly in the days of social media, where we think everybody else is having fabulous lives, going out and doing great things, and we're the only ones that aren't doing that. And so I want to talk, first of all, about taking steps to manage how we're feeling. And I mean, of course, the first step is that we come out of any sort of delusion or denial that we're not coping very well, you know, to stop making up a story that we are coping when we're not. And, um, you know, we often talk about exercise when we're talking about recovery and we talk about, and I'm not talking about necessarily running marathons, I'm just talking about taking a walk. And often a walk with a friend is a great thing to do, or a dog if you've got one, luckily, like I have. Um, and uh, I know many a morning when I'm out very early with the scarf and the, you know, the thick jackets and everything, walking the dog, I think I wouldn't be doing this for anybody else but you, Charlie, you know. Uh, but I have to kind of keep moving for him and uh, I know that if I didn't have him I wouldn't be out walking at a ridiculously early morning uh, hour of the morning um, so exercise is very helpful and can be great when we do it with a friend and often if we make those kind of commitments to connect with someone and say well let's just go for a walk and of course many of us who live on the northern beaches you know we've got beautiful beaches to walk along you know and stop and get a coffee uh, and this is a great thing to do, to connect with one another. <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, I think there's a view that we should have connection that's always deep and meaningful and, you know, uh, you know, we're doing a deep dive into something. And sometimes I think it's okay just to have a bit of a chat about the minute of life and what's been happening in your world uh, or what you think about things or hopes and dreams, not necessarily a deep dive, you know, we don't have to be unpacking our trauma all the time, you know. Do you know, I can remember years ago I was doing some therapy, I was a, a, a much younger woman, and uh, this I was bemoaning, you know, my mother, da 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 da, and how hard it was to have a relationship with her, she was a chronic alcoholic, God love her, she's died now, and 
this woman had listened to me for a number of weeks and she was nodding at me, you know, she was giving me the therapist nod and she said, oh, Diane, I think it's time you gave up hope. I was horrified. Then she said that you had a better past. And it was, there was a point at which I could hear her and understand that the acceptance I had to have around the fact that my mother and I were never going to have a great relationship. And it was just sufficient if we could just have a conversation and not be screaming at one another. Now, that may surprise many of you for me to tell you that. But the truth of it is that I, was so, I, had, so many, I had a foot back in the past for so long, I couldn't actually enjoy what I had in the present. And of course, when we're talking about anxiety, depression, loneliness, uh, or shame, guilt, any of those emotions, we're often, when we, when we sit with them, if we're in the toxic level of them, what we find is that there's a, is a link to the past and we need to do some work on that. Now, moving through this, we're, you know, we're talking about exercise and staying connected. Uh, we're talking about mindfulness and meditation. Well, we're big advocates of that at South Pacific and you know that. Uh, we're, we're advocates of, you know, changing our core beliefs, you know. My core belief was, uh, I don't matter. So I had to spend a lot of time at the end of my meditation saying, I, Diane, matter, you know, and it sounds ridiculous. It's a number of words, three words, I, Diane, matter. And it started to shift the perception I had of myself. But coming back to the point of when we're with, uh, in, in a state of low mood, it's important to actually think carefully about what's really happening. Is it situational? Now, that you, many of you know there is a, a disorder called seasonal affect disorder, and this happens for people in winter. It's not as prevalent here. It's very prevalent in some of the Northern European countries in the UK where the light is uh, very short. They have very short days, uh, so they do, and it is very bitterly cold a lot, a lot of the time there. So they'll often find that the medical profession will often find that there's many people that go into those low moods during that time. Light plays a particular part in keeping us uh, enlivened for our life. And if we're often in the dark, um, it can be counterintuitive for us. So when I'm talking about exercise, whether it's with a dog or not, whether it's with a friend or whether it's just to go down the road and get a coffee. It's important to look up. It's important to be part of what's happening in the world and not be walking down looking at your phone. Don't do that to yourself. Um, we talk often about um, when we've finished our programs at South Pacific, whether you're doing your intake program or your transitions program or both, um, you leave South Pacific with an aftercare plan, which you've put together about how you're going to transition yourself into recovery, how you're going to support yourself. Uh, and it's really important, uh, and I was talking to a young woman today who's struggling, but it's really important to understand that we have to back ourselves, uh, particularly important if we're dealing with um, childhood trauma or any level of addiction or mood disorder, but the mood disorders often come out of the trauma too, to be doing our 12-step recovery, which might be Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families, um, Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous. There's a, a plethora of 12-step programs that will help you. And, and it's critical that you connect in with the people that go because they're on the same journey you are. It's also critical that we get a sponsor and the trick early in the piece is to ask if you don't, if you're not sure, you ask somebody if they'll be a temporary sponsor, which means they sponsor you for three months while you settle into the program, get to meet some people, uh, and if you've chosen wisely enough, you'll probably find that they'll continue on to be your sponsor, and they get you through the first three steps in those first three months, and then you can start doing some work on step four and five, and, and get on with the rest of the program. So it's critical to have people that we reach out to if you want to feel like you're going to pick up a drink or you're going to have some sort of relapse, sex addiction, relapse, gambling, that you can actually reach out to people who are there to help you and there to support you. And the thing to remember about that is 
please don't do this to yourself where you think, oh, they wouldn't want to talk to me or I don't want to be a burden or any of that. I don't, please don't do that because by you making a phone call to them, you're helping them too. There's an, there's an adage in 12-step recovery that you give it away to keep it. And that is you give away what you've been given in the 12-step program to people who are coming after you. So please do not do that thing where oh, they wouldn't want to talk to me. If they've given you their phone number, if you've asked for it and they've given it, or they've just given it, they're actually saying to you, please reach out. And it's critical to do that. The other thing I want to uh, talk about is um, nutrition. Uh, I think it's critical that uh, at these times, particularly with so much um, unwellness around, that we take care of what we eat, um, try and eat in a healthy way, don't be eating all processed stuff, anything that's going to nourish our bodies, uh, because feeling sick, getting flus, colds, COVID, any of those, just make us feel even more depleted and on our own. And if we live on our own, it makes it doubly hard because we're doing it all by ourselves and that can be very difficult. Now, I also want to talk about tonight about um, any serious ongoing concerns uh, that you have uh, around these times. Uh, there have been many clients that have come to speak to me in the last month or so whom as a general rule would not normally say to me that things are tough out there uh, and that what they mean when they say that is that they're finding it hard not only in their workplaces uh, financially perhaps uh, but just generally in the way that the world is outside I think we're impacted by what's happening in the world generally, globally. I think that frightens many people. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, when I've got certain sorts of people saying to me it's tough out there, I have to sit up and take notice because I think, wow, this is unusual to hear this from these people. And I can only assume a couple of things. I think the weather deeply impacts people, the lack of light deeply impacts people. And I think oftentimes the trap will be that will come into recovery and we'll put a lot of effort into it. And we're around and we're doing meetings and we're you know, taking care of ourselves, we're seeing our therapist, we're doing day programs in South Pacific, you know, we're sh showing up and fronting up and doing our 12-step program. Now, the thing about that is um, what we're prone to do is, uh, and we're taking whatever medication we're supposed to take as prescribed, uh, but what will happen is after three or four months, maybe six months, maybe even a little less, depending on what you're dealing with, you'll start to actually think to yourself, you know, I'm really, I'm really travelling really well now. I'm really travelling very well. And uh, I don't think I need to go to so many meetings. Uh, I don't think I need to do that next, uh, you know, relapse prevention day program. Um, I think I can give mastering moods a miss. Uh, you know, the, it's like we start to step away from the things that have kept us and got us healthy and got us well. You know as well as I do. How many times have you joined a gym and never turned up? Or you've turned up for the first week and then you've never gone back? Now, there'll be those of you that are there every day. I know you, the exercise ones, and I think that's wonderful. But there's plenty of us that have done that. I'm going to get fit and join the gym and do all that and then you know disappear after two weeks and then wonder why I'm not getting fit. So just be careful. One of the traps I think in early recovery and for, even for those of us that have been around a little while is we can start to step back from the things that help us. And what happens is we start to hit a wall emotionally. We start to have the low mood. The anxiety starts to come back. We're feeling disconnected and lonely from other, you know, from those people around us. And then it's all very easy to say to us, or say it didn't really work, or there's something really wrong with me, or why doesn't it work for me like everybody else? So we'll start to unpack in our head instead of going, okay, there's all of this option here. I've got all of this. It's like a, a smorgasbord of recovery opportunities, a smorgasbord of tools I can use but I've stopped using half of them 
I'm just cherry picking now the ones I think I like. So I won't speak to the sponsor so often. I'll stop doing work on the steps because I think I've done enough. And that's when we run into trouble. Because my view about people who are in recovery, who hit a wall emotionally, it's not what happened last week, usually. It's as a rule, two things. You're doing things you, you shouldn't be doing or you're not doing things you should be doing. Two choices. And if we're not doing the things we should be doing, that's on us. And if we're doing things we shouldn't be doing, that's usually a, rate, a result of not doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves. So we have had a lot of people in recovery doing extremely well. And then every now and again, there'll be somebody who is the wheels fall off everything and they looked like they were really going to get it. And it's and the question always is, what have you been doing that you shouldn't been doing? And what are you not doing that you should be? Because ultimately, we at South Pacific will offer you the inpatient program, the day programs, uh, great medical care through the nurses and the psychiatrists, the therapists. If you want to pick the ball up and run with it, you can do that. The fact that we're sitting in winter and it's cold means we don't want to. Now, the one gift, one of the great gifts that COVID gave us as 12-step people, and even this really, is that you can do a meeting every night of the week online if you want. You can zoom in if you want to navigate the, the time difference. You can zoom into one in New York if you want. You can zoom into one in LA. You can do that. There's still many meetings that are hybrid. They have face-to-face -face and they'll have Zoom at the same time. So there's absolutely no excuse for you not doing them. I know there's a, a meeting in the mornings in Sydney uh, that's half an hour. And I know people who put their ears in, walk their dog, and they're listening to the meeting as they're walking the dog. Sometimes they share, sometimes they don't. There's absolutely no excuse. I've always an advocate, however, in early recovery that you do face to face because you need that connection with people. You need to eyeball people, you need to learn to trust them. And generally you don't in early recovery. So face to face is the preference, but if you can't do face to face, do a meeting online. So we're nearly at the end. Uh, I think I've talked about everything. Exercise, nutrition, staying connected, reaching out. Um, attending meetings having a sponsor doing your day programs if that's appropriate mindfulness and meditation and addressing any serious ongoing concerns so if you've been in a low mood before for winter don't blame winter this is a chronic problem and you need to reach out get your GP to refer you to somebody who can help you get yourself to a therapist or ring South Pacific's intake program and get yourself in there and look at it. I want to just say um, a couple of hellos. Hello to Ian from the UK. Thanks for logging on. That's great of you. Uh, and David, one of the best skills I learned at SBP is the ability to recognise triggers and view them from a safe distance rather than be in the response, the space between the trigger and reaction. Is it Absolutely perfect. Thank you. I want to say to you... Um, when I was, I think there's always a pause, isn't it? I mean, maybe in intent, it, it's like a nanosecond pause. And the reason a, a lot of new people will often say, why do I have to go to so many meetings? You know, no, 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 no. And what I say is this, is that when you've got neural pathways that are used to are being open to using things to get the dopamine hit in your life, keep your brain z zipping, what will happen is that you'll stop using the substance and we need to be in 12-step recovery or connecting with other people in recovery to start to learn the recovery language and to start to understand that there's a new way of life on offer. It's not the R1 polished up, it's a new way of life. Right. What will happen to new people though, and it happens to all of us, even those of us that have been around a long time, is you're walking down the street, you're getting triggered all the time. But if you're in the orbit of recovery and you're talking recovery and you're doing recovery, not just talking about it, the trigger won't take hold. But if you step back, as I was talking about before, that it's easier for the trigger to take hold. 
I totally agree with you, David, that the space between the trigger and the reaction is crucial. It's the pause, and it may be infinitesimally small, but it's enough. If you're in that orbit of recovery, you will reach out and talk to somebody. So, um, thank you, Ian. James, if getting back into recovery and doing... I think it means I'm getting back into recovery and doing... What are your recommendations? Jamie, just go where you feel comfortable and move around. If you're living... I don't, I'm not sure where you're living, but if you're living in Sydney or any of the big capital cities, there's a variety of meetings... ID meetings, steps meetings, topic meetings, all sorts of things. You go where you're comfortable and where you feel valued. And and if you can, put your hand up to do a little bit of service in the meeting. That will make sure that you get there and become part of the group. I think that would be very wise. So, I think I've covered everything I wanted to say. Um, as usual, it's very... Um, lovely to be with you um, I have not liked winter this time in July 2024 I've not liked it at all uh, I think I said at the beginning when I came back from Bali I, I walked into 10 degrees and torrential rain and was not impressed I can assure you and I had to work really hard and just getting into being grateful that's the other thing that might be helpful Jamie do a gratitude list every day just half a dozen things that you're grateful for and it may be as simple as you know I've got my health or I've got two arms and two legs or you know I live in a great suburb I've got a great family or whatever it is doesn't matter what it is or the fact that you're in recovery because often when we you know when we're in that mode of being grateful for the things we do have we allow more to come in and more to come to us so Lovely to be with you tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for those who will watch us um, on the recording, which will be on the South Pacific YouTube uh, later. And uh, I am aware, I'm told, that many of you do log on later and watch, and I understand that. So thank you for that also. I think we can. Thank you, Cynthia. First time listening. Oh, I hope it was helpful. Um, the hand wave there uh, and Debbie Linky lovely thank you Linky and I know that you know there's been sad days recently about a friend of ours who passed and um, I just acknowledge her because she was one of us and she didn't make it and that's the tragedy of the disease uh, but I'm conscious that you you have support around you and I hope that your uh, heart remains open and not because of it so um, I think we're going to leave it there thank you very much everyone for those of you that did log on and those of you that have said hello and we'll catch up with you next time hopefully in warmer weather thank you Maria grateful that you uh, logged on